Okay, so it's um, a pleasure to uh, introduce Professor Kenny Heraponta from Lovebara with his second uh, lecture on uh, modular forms now uh, in regard to PDs. So, so please, Jenya. Thank you, Bolia. Uh, so good to see you again. Uh, let me remind you in a couple of words what we did last time. Uh, so modular forms, we looked at classical modular forms, which are holomorphic functions on the upper half plane. And uh, they behave in a certain way under linear fractional action of SL2Z on the upper half plane. Uh, and remarkably, modular forms uh, uh, satisfy uh, Eisenstein series, other uh, theta constants, and so on. They satisfy relatively simple algebraic differential equations of third order and fourth order, uh, with uh, uh, respectively SL2R and GL2R symmetry. Uh, this th this uh, generalizes um, to modular forms of several variables, such as Ziegel modular forms, Picard modular forms, and uh, uh, Jacobi forms, and so on. Uh, in this case, every modular form on a Lie group, on a subgroup, discrete subgroup of a Lie group G, uh, satisfies a certain G invariant involutive PD system. Uh, which more or less specifies this modular form uniquely. So there is an action of the group G on the solution space of the system. And this modular form, your modular form belongs to the open orbit. Okay, today I will show you, and uh, yeah, and uh, it is precisely why these modular forms, sorry, why these differential equations that modular forms uh, feature in various applications in mathematical physics and so on. Algebraic geometry as well. Uh, so uh, today I will show you two examples uh, of uh, uh, applications of modular forms. Uh, so this is a, a plan of my, the plan of my talk. I will start with a few words on what dispersionless integrability is. Just one slide. I will not go into technical details. And then I will discuss two examples, 3D dispersionless Hirota type equations. These are PDs of second order of this form where uh, u is a function of three variables, x1, x2, x3, u, x, i, x, j, a second order partial derivative. So it's uh, uh, this equation involves second order derivatives of u only. Uh, and it turns out that the generic integrable equation of this kind is defined by uh, uh, where uh, this, uh, this function f is a theta constant. Okay, I will explain this uh, uh, later. Uh, and then uh, I will look at 3D integrable Lagrangians, equations, uh, Euler Lagrange equations corresponding to first order Lagrangians with this Lagrangian density. So these are second order uh, PDs in F and integrability conditions imply that, uh, 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 that this F is a Picard modular form. So F satisfies a certain overdetermined PD system, and the generic solution of this PD system is a Picard modular form. So, uh, uh, okay, so uh, I have 27 slides. I'm not sure I will be able to show all of them. We'll see how it goes. Uh, so uh, to kind of summarize, the main message is that coefficients of dispersionless integrable PDs in three dimensions uh, uh, of generic dispersionless integrable PDs in 3D can be written in terms of either generalized hypergeometric functions, which in special cases are reduced to modular forms. All right. So, okay, let me move on. Uh, a few words about dispersionless integrability. So, there are no formulas here. Uh, there is a, a method of hydrodynamic reductions. So, a partial differential equation in 3D is said to be integrable if it possesses infinitely many reductions to a collection of commuting systems of hydrodynamic type. Okay, if you have never, uh, have never seen it, uh, this tells you nothing more or less, uh, but I'm not going to, to, to go into more detail here. Uh, then there is a method of dispersionless lux pairs. Uh, so we say uh, uh, 
so there are three, I'm, I'm showing you three seemingly different approaches to dispersionless integrability in 3D, which actually appear to be, uh, turn out to be equivalent. They, get, they lead to the same integrability conditions and therefore to the same classification results. So uh, we say that a PD in 3D is said to be integrable if it possesses a dispersionless lux pair. Uh, uh, roughly speaking, it means that there, are, uh, there is a pair of vector fields uh, depending on a spectral parameter on an auxiliary variable, such that the requirement of commutativity of these vector fields gives you uh, the original PD. And finally, integrability on solutions. We say that a PD in 3D is integrable if its characteristic variety defines integrable conformal geometry on every solution, namely einstein wild geometry for second order PDs. And remarkably, all these approaches are equivalent and they are efficient. Uh, all of them are efficiently verifiable. So given a PD, we can eff efficiently test either, uh, uh, whether any of these properties holds. And given a class of PDs, uh, so we can derive integrability conditions. So say, suppose your class of PDs depends on some arbitrary parameters or functions. Uh, then we can apply this integrability test. We can get constraints for these functions, which are equivalent to integrability. All right, so let me start with Hirota type equations in three dimensions. So these are equations of this kind, of this kind, just a single relation connecting partial derivatives, second order partial derivatives of a function of three variables. So you have ux1, x1, ux1, x2, ux1, x3, six total, six partial derivatives all together, and there is a relation connecting them. Uh, in some cases, it will be convenient to resolve it with respect to say ux1, x1, and write this equation in the form ux1, x1 equals a function depending on the rest, on the remaining five partial derivatives. All right, and this function f uh, must satisfy certain integrability conditions. So let me show you some examples. One very well-known example is this, is a dispersionless Kadams of Petvashvili equation. So you see it involves, uh, u is a function of x, y, t. Sometimes I'm using x1, x2, x3. Sometimes I use x, y, t. So this is the equation. Uh, it, it, <laughs> you see it depends on second order derivatives only. And it satisfies all integrability properties. It passes the method of hydrodynamic reductions. It possesses a dispersionless lux pair. And on every solution of this PD, its characteristic variety defines einstein wild geometry. All this is well known. Another well-known example is Bohr-Finley equation. Uxx plus Uyy minus e to the UTT is zero. Again, it says it it's, it's integrable and satisfies the same properties as Kadams of Petrushvili equation, but they're not equivalent. Let me show you a slightly more sophisticated example. So uh, first uh, uh, it appeared in a paper uh, in, uh, by Maxim Pavlov in 2003. So let's look at the class of second order PDs of this form, of this particular form. Uh, uh, so this form was uh, <clears throat> uh, motivated by the study of hydrodynamic chains, doesn't matter. Let's look at equations of this kind where H is some function of Uxx. So at this stage, undetermined functions. So we can apply integrability test to PDs of this class. And it turns out that H cannot be arbitrary. It must satisfy this OD, which is called the Shazi equation. It's a well-known equation, and it's well known that its general solution, generic solution, is Eisenstein series, E2. We discussed Eisenstein series last time, but E2 of tau is this expression. If you remember from the previous talk, this is the Eisenstein series. Sigma one of n is the divisor function. It's the sum of divisors of n counting one and n itself as devices. 
right? So this is the equation. Sorry, this is the Eisenstein series and you have to scale its argument instead of tau, you substitute I S over pi. And this gives you a real valued solution uh, to the Shazi equation, right? Shazi equation is known to be invariant under SL to Z. And you see, this was to, the, to my knowledge, this was the first example where modular forms appeared in the coefficients of an integrable equation. So integrability conditions imply that coefficients are modular forms, all right? So this example already suggests that, okay, if you take a, a second order Hirota-type equation, write it in the form, say, UTT equals a function of the remaining UTX, UTY, UXX, UXY, UYY, right, of the remaining five derivatives, then this expression for F shouldn't be simple. Because even in this class, in this simple class, we have modular forms appearing. So this, the general class shouldn't be simple. It turns out that generic Hirota type equation is expressible via um, uh, Ziegel modular forms, uh, namely theta constants, which are Ziegel modular forms of weight one half. All right, so let me move to the next slide. Uh, so what is known about Hirota type equations? So just a summary of known results. Uh, first of all, this class, uh, uh, okay, let's introduce this matrix capital U, which is the Hessian matrix of our function U. U depends on three variables. So this Hessian matrix is a three by three symmetric matrix. And it turns out that uh, Hirota equations are invariant under the following changes of U, under the following changes of U, which are induced by symplectic transformations of the space Xi and first order derivatives Ui. So where the matrix U goes to AU plus B times CU plus D minus one, where A, B, C, D are three by three matrices. And if you put them like A, B, C, D in a two by two matrix, so you, you form A, B, C, D, two by two matrix, where each block itself is a three by three matrix. Then you get SP6R, you get a six by six matrix. And uh, uh, this is how SP6R acts on the space of three by three symmetric matrices. It's uh, uh, standard, uh, standard action. Uh, if you identify three by three symmetric matrices with Lagrange and Grassmannian, then uh, this is natural action of SP6R on the Lagrange and Grassmannian. If you think of U as a matrix from the Ziegel upper half space, then this is how, uh, okay, uh, uh, FP6R acts on the Ziegel upper half space. So, okay, this is the invariance group. And note that dimension of SP6R is 21. So, we have a 21 dimensional group acting on Hirota equations and preserving their integrability. Okay, then there is a, uh, uh, we, uh, then we proved in this paper, which is shown here below in 2010, that the class of Hirota equations, uh, that the parameter space of integrable Hirota type equations is 21 dimension. All right, so we derived integrability conditions. They form an involutive system for the right-hand side of the equation. And uh, by simple parameter count, you, you, you can see that uh, the uh, solution space is 21 dimension. And there is this SP6R acting on the solution space. 20, 21 dimensional group acting on a 21 dimensional solution space of certain involutive system. So this means, uh, yeah, and one can prove that this action is locally free. Uh, this means that uh, uh, the action of SP6R possesses an open orbit. On, uh, so there is an open orbit in the solution space, kind of generic, open orbit, and there are also degenerate orbits. But we are interested in this generic orbit, right? Generic open orbit. So each, uh, each 
uh, solution corresponding to this, all solutions corresponding to this generic orbit are equivalent because they are obtainable one from another by the action, by this action, all right? Okay, uh, so uh, geometrically, but I, I will not be using this uh, third point of view. Uh, geometrically, Hirota type equation can be viewed as the equation of a hypersurface, five dimensional hypersurface in, uh, in the Lagrangian Grassmannian, which is parameterized by three by three symmetric matrices, right? But to me, it will be more convenient, more useful to view the space of three by three symmetric matrices as the Ziegler perhaps space. So on which SP6R acts like that, like in a linear, linear fractional way. So it's the analog of the upper half plane. Uh, uh, now uh, our space is three by three symmetric matrices and SP6R acts in this way, uh, uh, right? And functions of three by three symmetric matrices, which satisfy certain invariance properties under this section are called Ziegel modular forms. Um, all right. Mm. Okay, now what is this master equation? Uh, 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 the master equation is the equation corresponding to this open orbit. Uh, all, masters, all master equations are equivalent. So I claim that uh, the ma Hirota master equation is given by the formula theta m of second order derivative equal zero, where theta m is any genus three theta constant with an even characteristic. On the next slide, I will define what this means, right? Uh, theta constant with an even characteristic. And this, uh, this was proved in our paper with uh, Fabian Clary based on the construction uh, by Desk and Sokolov. We still don't have kind of, uh, we would, uh, I, I was hoping to, give, to get a kind of constructive proof we just shows that uh, equation of this kind satisfies our integrability conditions. But this we couldn't do for some reason. And uh, the proof is very indirect and I'm not going to discuss it. <clears throat> so it's well known that this equation, theta constant applied to a, sym a, a symmetric matrix equals zero defines a hypersurface in the Zickel upper half space, which is known as a genus three hyperelliptic divisor. So what this means, uh, uh, okay, in, in, in a few words. So let's take a genus three curve, all right? Genus three algebraic curve. Then it has a period matrix, which is three by three symmetric matrix. Strictly speaking, it's complex valued with a negative definite uh, imaginary part, but Okay, doesn't matter. Three by three symmetric matrix is the period matrix, uh, right? Uh, it turns out that uh, more or less every uh, symmetric matrix can be obtained as a uh, period matrix of some uh, algebraic surface of genus three. Now uh, we can ask a question and what is, uh, what if our surface of genus three is hyperelliptic. It turns out that in this case, period matrices do not span the full space of uh, three by three symmetric matrices. They form a hypersurface and it's called hyperelliptic divisor. So it's uh, a hypersurface formed by period matrices of genus three hyperelliptic surface, uh, hy hyperelliptic curves. Um, all right. And it's known, it's known that a uh, uh, hyperelliptic divisor is defined by these equations. Uh, theta M applied to this UIJ symmetric matrix equals zero, right? It doesn't matter which even characteristic you take, uh, all these equations are equivalent under SP, right? So you can take any M, it doesn't matter which one, right? Okay, so as you see, the, the, the answer is uh, highly transcendental. Uh, let me define you uh, theta constants of genus, doesn't matter that it's, uh, yeah, genus three with characteristics. They are defined 
as the following exponential sums. Uh, so here, tau is a three by three symmetric matrix, tau. What was uij on the previous slide? Tau is just three by three symmetric matrix. Uh, and it appears here in the formula, you see it appears here. N, N, summation is over N. N is an element of Z3, right? Uh, what are mu and nu? Mu and nu are just uh, vectors of zeros and ones, three component vectors. Mu is a vector consisting of zeros and ones, and nu is also a vector of zeros and ones. Uh, we say that a characteristic is uh, even, uh, even if this expression is even, right? If this expression is even. Uh, so in genus three, there are 36 such theta characteristics, mu nu, right? Uh, and they give a, a rise to 36 uh, theta constants, theta constants with even characteristics, right? Here, M can take uh, 36 different uh, values. But as I said, all the all corresponding equations are equivalent, right? And together, all together, they define hyperelliptic divisor. It's a classical result in algebraic geometry due to Schrodinger. All right, so this is uh, all about, uh, uh, yeah, maybe uh, the, the question, there are some open problems here, uh, uh, open problems. Uh, so it would be really desirable to find a purely computational proof that theta constants satisfy the corresponding integrability conditions. Uh, but this uh, turns out to be tricky for, 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 there is one reason, I don't want to stop on this, uh, but it would be good to prove that theta constants satisfy integrability conditions. Uh, and finally, it's an interesting question to classify uh, uh, single orbits. So this uh, theta constants, they correspond to the open orbit, to the generic orbit of uh, Hirota equations. But there are various single orbits and there, is, there are quite a few of them. At least, uh, I, I think more than 20 the generate orbits. For instance, the equations I showed at the beginning, like DKP, Boer-Finley, then Pavlov equation, uh, they belong to single orbits. They're not generic, all right? So, because generic is expressed in terms of theta constants and that uh, the ones, uh, uh, the previous ones are all either elementary functions or just modular forms of one variable. They're all non-equivalent. All right, so it would be interesting to classify the generations of this open orbit, the generation of theta, the generations of theta constants. All right, so this is it about Hirota equations, and let me move on to Lagrangians, where I will show you some more explicit formulas. Uh, okay, uh, I'm looking at Lagrangians of this kind, of this kind. For, uh, Lagrangian density is a, a function of first order derivatives of some function v. v of x1, x2, x3 is a function of three variables. This is the euler lagrange equation, second order pd for v. Given f, f is given, right? f is some given function. Then uh, this will become a second order pd for v. And here are some examples. Okay, I'm using exactly the same words as before, but the equations here are like potential forms of the previous, uh, of the equations I showed before. What I call dispersionless KP here is not exactly what it was before. It's its potential version, but it doesn't matter, they are equivalent. So this equation, which now I call dispersionless Kadams of Petrashvili, is comes from this Lagrangian density. So if, if for f you take this, then the Euler Lagrange equation gives you this. If for, La, for the Lagrangian density you, get, you take this, then as Euler Lagrange equation, you get Borfinley equation, this one. Uh, uh, so let me show you a slightly, uh, a, a, a more interesting example where modular forms appear. So let's look at Lagrangian density densities of this form, vx1, vx2 times a function of vx3, 
right? So this is the corresponding Euler Lagrange equation, right? It contains G, this function G and its derivative, right? Uh, and it turns out that this, uh, the corresponding Euler Lagrange equation is not integrable for generic G. There must be a constraint for G. And this constraint is fourth order ordinary differential equation written here. In fact, this ordinary differential equation was discussed last time. Uh, uh, this differential equation is a fourth order GL2 invariant ODE for this modular form, for this Eisenstein series, right? Shown here, G of Z equals this. And remember that Q equals E to the two pi I Z. So this is uh, the Eisenstein series it's called E13, Eisenstein series of weight one and level three, uh, which we discussed last time. And this is the ODE for this Eisenstein series. So it turns out that this Lagrangian density gives an integrable Euler Lagrange equation, even though only if G uh, is the Eisenstein series, it's a modular form. Uh, Okay, again, uh, what is the generic integrable density? Clearly, it's clear from this answer, from this example, that the general answer will not be trivial, right? It will be a modular form of three variables, right? Here, you see dependence on Vx1 and Vx2 is simple, but dependence on Vx3 is modular. So if we now take a generic F of all these three variables, Vx1, Vx2, Vx3, we'll get something complicated. And I will show you uh, a system of differential equations, integrability conditions for this, for this F, all right? Okay, uh, let me summarize known results. First of all, the parameter space of integrable Lagrangian densities is 20 dimensional. I will show you where this number 20 is coming from on the next slide when I will write down a system of differential equations for F, which are integrability conditions, all right? It's clear from this system that the solution space is 20 dimensions. Uh, furthermore, uh, this system of integrability conditions uh, is invariant on the 20 dimensional symmetry group. And this symmetry group acts on the parameter space of Lagrangian densities with an open orbit. So exactly the same story as for Hirota type equations. All right, dimension is different, but uh, okay. But uh, essentially it's the same. We have a certain PD system, involutive, with 20 dimensional solution space. We have a group acting as a symmetry group of this system in a locally free way with an open orbit, 20 dimensional group, and it acts with an open orbit. So there is a generic kind of master Lagrangian, I call it master Lagrangian, uh, which belongs to this open orbit. And the construction of this master Lagrangian turns out to be uh, quite tricky. It turns out that the answer is formulated in terms of Picard modular forms. Okay, this is what I'm going to discuss in the rest of my talk. And this is based on our paper with Adesky, where Sasha Adesky has guessed uh, kind of by uh, using computer experiments, he has guessed uh, the ansatz, the correct formula for this F. And then uh, it was uh, kind of proved in this paper, which is still unfinished in progress. Okay, so integrability conditions. Uh, so F is a function of three variables. F is our Lagrangian density. Uh, let me call these variables. F is a this f is a function of three variables: vx1, vx2, vx3. Let me call them x, y, z. Right. So f now is a function of x, y, z. I need a system of differential equations for f. So let's do the following. Let's introduce first of all the Hessian matrix of f, and denote by capital H its determinant. So it's the Hessian of of uh, of the function f. Uh, let's also introduce this matrix, which is called bordered Hessian. Bordered Hessian. 
of, of the function f. So it's it's bordered by this row and this column, right? Uh, let me also introduce third order differential symmetric differential of f and fourth order symmetric differential of f. Okay, then the integrability conditions are written here. They're written in quite a compact way. Fourth order differential of f is d3f times dh over h, h is this, plus three over h determinant of differential of this matrix, right? So what is uh, the left-hand side of this identity? It's a, a symmetric form in uh, dx dy dz of degree four, right? Because it's fourth order differential. So it's a symmetric form in dx dy dz of degree four. And the right-hand side of this identity is also a symmetric form in dx dy dz of degree four. And these two forms are equal. So we have to equate coefficients at monomials in dx dy dz of the same kind of degree, right? And this will give us all possible fourth order derivatives of f expressed in terms of low order derivatives, third and second order derivatives, right? So in other words, this system has the following structure. All fourth order derivatives of the function f that you can form, I think there are, I don't remember how many of them there are. I think Boris knows this by heart. You would tell me how many of them there are. I forgot. Uh, anyway, all fourth order derivatives of this function are certain explicit functions of low order derivatives. Uh, so, okay, this system is highly overdetermined. And the first miracle is it's an involution. It's automatically involutive. Right now, let's count the dimension of the solution space. What is free here in this system? Uh, you see, fourth order derivatives we know, but the function f, its first order derivatives, second order derivatives, and third order derivatives can be arbitrary at a given point. Right, so f is one constant, its first order derivatives, there are three of them another three constants, so four altogether, then second order derivatives gives extra six constants, altogether 10, plus third order derivatives, another 10, all right? This gives 20. So this is the number uh, of parameters, of free parameters in this, in the solutions of this involutive system. So it's a system of PDs, and its solution space is 20 dimensional, as the simple count shows, all right? Um, and uh, it's invariant under a 20 dimensional group. All right. Uh, uh, to for now, the, uh, my next goal will be to um, write down to represent a general solution of this system. And there are several representations for this general solution. Uh, we call it param parametric representation, power series representation, and theta representation. There are three different representations, and they involve a certain sequence of integers, CK. So I will need a certain sequence of integers to represent a generic solution. And this sequence of integers, uh, uh, to a mathematic, the easiest way to introduce them for a mathematical physicist is this. You take this OD, which is a fourth order OD for the Weierstrass sigma function with g2 equals zero, it's called equian harmonic case. So you look, you take the second order, sorry, fourth order OD, and you look for its solution as a power series. Uh, when k is zero, you get z to some power. So it starts with actually with z. Sigma of z is z plus so on. Uh, you, uh, the next term will be z to the seven or uh, whatever. Right, uh, so if you look at solution sigma of z in this form and plug this into here, into this equation, you'll get these CKs uniquely. And they are written here. It's one, one, minus six, minus five, five, two, and so on. It's a fast growing sequence, but, um, uh, uh, but this is a holomorphic function. This grows even faster. Yeah, so this is a holomorphic function defined on the upper half plane. 
on the whole plane, actually. Uh, so these are the integers. So in other words, uh, CKs are uh, Taylor coefficients of the expansion of sigma of large trust sigma function. That's all. They are integers and they will feature in the formulas for the general Lagrangian density for some reason. All right. uh, <clears throat> so remember this formula for sigma of z. Uh, so it's sum ck z to the power 6k plus 1 divided by 6k plus 1 factorial. So z, z to the 7, z to the uh, uh, 13, and so on. Right? Um, uh, so because a very similar formula, but slightly different, will appear later with ck, not ck, but ck squared. And we will see that if we change here ck to ck squared, then instead of elliptic function, we'll get a modular form. And this is really remarkable. OK, but this will appear later. At this stage, uh, uh, what I need are just this, uh, this integers, ck. All right. Uh, now, let me look at Lagrangian densities of this form of the simplest form. We already discussed them. And G, if you remember, was, a, uh, Eisen, was the Eisenstein series E13 of Z, right? Uh, so this is the Lagrange equation. I already showed it before for this Lagrangian density. And this is the integrability conditions. Condition, just one single. Uh, in fact, for Lagrangian densities of this kind, all integrability conditions, are satisfied apart from one, are satisfied identically apart from one which gives this OD, right? And uh, its generic solution is the Eisenstein series. And now, uh, uh, so we already know one representation for this solution, it's the Eisenstein series, but I will show you two different representations, uh, uh, power series representation and parametric representation, right? Theta, what I call theta representation, is precisely the, the formula of Eisenstein series I showed before. So I will show you two more representations uh, because uh, all of them, all these representations work for generic case as well uh, with some natural generalizations. So, okay, uh, I will, so the next slide to define parametric representation, I need a, a certain uh, hypergeometric equation. So, Let's look at this. Let's take this hypergeometric equation, right? Hypergeometric equation for an auxiliary function h of the parameter u. All right. Uh, so, uh, what is the, uh, it's a well, very well known equation, and the geometry be, behind this equation is also well known. What are solutions to this equation? Okay. It turns out that we need to introduce this family of curves. They are plane algebraic curves on the RT plane. So we have plane with coordinates R and T. U is a parameter, so precisely this parameter. So these are these curves have genus two, genus two, and since we have this R cubed here, they're called trigonal. These are genus two trigonal curves. Sometimes they're called Picard, Fuchs cur Picard curves, right? Picard curves. Uh, all right, uh, so uh, let's look at this family of curves. Let's take uh, this, uh, this curve has genus two, so it has two holomorphic differentials. One of them is dt over r, this thing. This is a holomorphic differential on this curve. All right, so let's uh, take periods of this curve. So in other words, uh, uh, we can integrate uh, this differential from A to B along this curve, where A, B take other branch points of this curve, which are zero, one, infinity, and U. This is where this thing vanishes, right? Uh, uh, so we take all these periods. It looks like there are many of them, right? You, you can, A and B can vary, can take any of these four values. It looks like there are many periods, but it turns out that only two of them are linearly independent. So the space of periods is two dimensional. And it turns out that these periods form a basis of solutions of this hypergeometric equation. Right? It's a 
It's in other words, in, uh, uh, there is a terminology for this. So this hypergeometric equation is the Picard-Fuchs equation for this family of curves, right? This means that the uh, that periods of this differential along this curve, periods of this differential satisfy this hypergeometric equation. So it's Picard-Fuchs equation for this family of curves. So now I formulate. Uh, uh, I formulate, uh, well, let me go back. Uh, uh, I give you three representations of this function G and it will involve uh, constant CK first and it will involve this hypergeometric equation. All right, this hypergeometric equation and its basis of solutions. All right, so here is the result. It's formulated on one slide. Uh, this function g of z can be represented by one of the following forms. g of z is this. This is the Eisenstein series. I already discussed this representation. So g of z, it satisfies a fourth order nonlinear PD, OD, sorry, and its generic solution is this Eisenstein series. Uh, power series expansion. Uh, the generic solution g of z can be written as a power series. Sum CK squared, Z to the 6K plus one divided by 6K plus one factorial. Uh, you see this, we have this CK squared. If you remember for sigma of Z, for the Weierstrass sigma, this was just CKs without square, right? So it's quite a remarkable example. I think it's a unique example of its kind. Uh, uh, there aren't many, there shouldn't be many examples like this. So when you put, when you remove this square, you get just this sum with coefficient CK. Then it's an elliptic function, Weierstrass elliptic sigma function. When you put squares, it becomes a modular form. It, ge it gets, uh, its invariance group becomes non-abelian, completely different, right? So it's really a remarkable phenomenon and I don't know any direct proof of this how to get from the equation for sigma function to the equation for G. Uh, because the squaring coefficients is not a kind of, it's not a simple differential operation. It's not a differential substitution. Otherwise everything would be easy, right? So you take a power series and you for some reason square its, square its coefficients, right? And one PD and OD for sigma function becomes an ODE for modular form, right? Uh, 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 so, but it's not a change of variables. So it's, 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 it's a tricky fact. And then parametric representation. So this function G of Z can be represented as follows. Uh, G is a function of some parameter U and Z is a function of some parameter U. So uh, uh, remember the hypergeometric equation I showed on the previous slide, this one, let me go back this hypergeometric equation. So it has two linearly independent solutions. Let me call them H1 of U, H2 of U, right? Two linearly independent solutions. And then I introduce, uh, I introduce this parametric formula. Z is H1 of U divided by H2 of U and G is just H2 of U, right? It turns out that uh, uh, G of Z is also a generic solution. Right, uh, I have to uh, make a comment here. So I call this function G of Z, I call this G of Z, and this I call this G of Z. But these are not the same G of Z. They are all generic solutions, but they are not identically equal to each other. They are equal up to a transformation from the equivalence goal, right? So then they, this, it doesn't identically equal this. Right, they are equal up to a certain transformation from the equivalence group. But okay, I am abusing notation. I am calling all of them G of Z because they uh, play the same role. They represent generic solution of the corresponding OD, both of the OD. Right, they're generic solutions, but up to the action of the group. But in the short case, you're actually free to choose H1 and H2 and adjust that it will be actually your G, right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I can adjust H1 and H2. 
uh, by the way, it's clear when I change the basis h1, h2, z transforms in a linear fractional way, right? Because from h1, h2, I can I can put here alpha h1, a h1 plus b h2, and here c h1 plus d h2. And if I divide by h2, I get a linear fractional transformation of z. So when I change a basis h1, h2, I get linear fractional transformation of z, right? Okay, so uh, this is uh, one thing. Now let me move on to a slightly more general situation. And probably I will discuss this case and I will not discuss the generic case. Okay, I have 15, something like 15 minutes. So let me discuss this case, slightly more generic than the previous. And I will not do the most general because it's not really uh, so important. Actually, it is, but uh, from, for this talk, it's probably not so important. Um, so here, g is some function. And if you uh, plug this function, plug this ansatz into integrability conditions, you get a certain system of PDEs for g, which express all fourth order derivatives of g in terms of low order derivatives. How many partial derivatives of g do we have? Uh, it depends on two variables this time, yeah? So there are five fourth order derivatives. And all of them are expressed in terms of low order derivatives. They, uh, this system for G is involutive. Its solution space is 10 dimensional. And this uh, system is invariant on the 10 dimensional group. It's a reduction of the general picture. Anyway, this is the corresponding Gunnar Lagrange equation. And there is an involutive system for G, which I'm not writing down, right? Uh, so again, I will show you three different parameterizations of the generic solution, uh, G. One is a theta representation, uh, like analogous to the Eisenstein series representation. Another is power series representation. And one is parametric representation. So they are all equivalent up to the action of the symmetry. So, okay, to define parametric representation, I need to introduce a certain hypergeometric system. Uh, uh, this will be, it's called Appel hypergeometric system. So this is my auxiliary hypergeometric system. H is a function of U1, U2. U1, U2 are auxiliary parameters. Uh, uh, this is called euler poisson darbu equation, but it's supplemented by these two equations. This system is involutive, uh, and its solution space is three-dimensional. So this system has three linearly independent solutions, all right? Three linearly independent solutions. I call them H1, H2, H3, and they will feature in the parametric representation. So what is the geometry? There is some geometry behind this. Uh, which was actually uncovered by Picard as far back as in 1883. Actually, it's a remarkable paper uh, where Picard uh, it, it actually, trans uh, to me, it's transcendentally difficult wo work that Picard did. He was calculating with period matrices of certain uh, family of curves. It's extremely tricky paper. Uh, uh, so uh, wh uh, what is the geometry? of this system. So, okay, let's look at this family of curves. Before, if you cross this last bracket, this last bracket, Q minus U2, it will be the family of curves I showed before, but now we have an extra bracket. So, uh, so here, uh, U and R uh, are uh, just uh, coordinates on the plane, R Q plane, and U1, U2 are parameters. So it's a family of curves depending on two parameters, u1, u2. dq over r is a holomorphic differential on this curve, on this curve. And this curve has genus three, right? So they are called genus three Picard trigonal curves. Trigonal because it's a triple cover, you see, because of this cubic, uh, cubic power. r cubed equals something depending on q. It's a trigonal curve. And these curves were considered by Picard. All right, so uh, this differential, omega, has many periods. 
you can integrate omega from say one branch point to another branch point and these branch points are zero one u one u two and infinity all right you can take all these periods integrals between branch points of this differential there are many of them but it turns out that only three of these periods are linearly independent right three periods are linearly independent and these three periods are solutions oops sorry oh. And these three periods are solutions to this hypergeometric system. In other words, uh, uh, this hypergeometric system is a Picard Fuchs system for this family of curves. All right. Uh, uh, in other words, periods of this holomorphic differential satisfy this system. All right. Now I think I'm ready to formulate the general theory. So, uh, uh, oh, good. Uh, there are three representations of this function g of y z, right? Theta representation. G of y z is y plus. Uh, you see, if you cross this thing, you'll get some of these exponentials. It was the Eisenstein series shown before, but now we have this y variable, and uh, okay, this is the formula. Uh, it's quite tricky to prove that this formula indeed solves the uh, PD system, the integrability conditions. But this formula was kind of, I would say, found experimentally by Sasha Desky, and then it was proved by Fabian Fleury, right, in full generality. Uh, uh, it was proved that this formula indeed solves the uh, integrability conditions. This is quite tricky. Uh, because uh, strictly speaking, this expression is not a modular form. It doesn't transform as a modular form, but it's differential of this function does transform as a modular form, vector valued modular form. But the, this thing itself is not modular. It has some wrong terms in its transformation law. All right, then there is a power series representation which was found by uh, Zagir, uh, quite a remarkable formula where this uh, very symmetric, where these CJs, remember integers CJs, the expansions, Taylor coefficients of the sigma function. For some reason, they appear here. Uh, there is a reason because, okay, you have sigma function here in this expression. So if you, roughly speaking, if you expand this in the power series, you get this, right? But it's not straightforward. Uh, to get from here to here, it's also not straightforward. There are some subtle theorems about expansions of, of theta functions. And then there is a parametric formula. So G, you see, is a function of Y, Z. So now uh, Y, Z, and G will be functions of parameters, U1, U2, which are the, for the formulas are as follows. You take three solutions of the Appel hypergeometric system, call them H1, H2, and H3. So y is h1 over h3, z is h2 over h3, and g is some function of this expression f of s, where f has to satisfy this OD. Uh, I'm not so, uh, writing its explicit solution because it's hypergeometric function. So it's quite a tricky formula, okay? But all these representations are equivalent. They're not identically equal. The, these functions, although they're denoted by G, but in fact, they are equal up to equivalence group. They're not identically equal. All right, I think I'll show you a few more slides. Okay. Uh, so uh, it, it was in fact, uh, uh, so if you look, let's return back. Let's look at the first two equations, at the first two equations. Uh, so you can see that H1, H2, H3, remember they are periods of this family of trigonal curves, right? H1, H2, H3 are periods. And this map from U1, U2 to YZ is called the period map. And this is precisely what was considered by Picard. This map was considered by Picard in 1883. And Picard was interested in its inversion. So suppose that y and z are, okay, defined like that. 
H1, H2, H3 are periods. Okay, you have to specify what these periods are. You have to specify their form. But okay, let me not do it. How to invert this formula? How to express U1, U2 in terms of Y and Z? And Picard remarkably showed that the inverse map is also given by quite a similar formula where phi1, phi2, and phi0 are certain, are certain uh, modular forms on the complex ball, which is given by this formula. Yeah, yz restricted by this formula. Uh, y and z here are complex, strictly speaking, yeah? So uh, 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 these are modular forms on this ball. And there is a group, Picard modular group acting on this ball. So these functions, phi1, phi2, phi0, uh, they behave as modular forms of suitable weight and uh, uh, character under this group, okay? And these modular forms were well studied in the literature. So here are some names. Uh, so there are books, in, in fact, written by what Holt Sapfel wrote a book about these modular forms, just these particular modular forms, right? So uh, let me show you one more slide. Uh, okay, uh, so I remember this modular forms, phi zero, phi one, phi two. These are called Picard modular forms on the Picard modular group, all right? So uh, let's introduce the following object on the right-hand side. First of all, okay, let, let's look at this one. So phi zero, phi one, phi two are certain modular forms. Okay, let's form this expression, this product. Clearly, this is also a modular form because modular forms form a ring, right? So this is a modular form. What is remarkable that this modular form is a cube of some other modular form, which I call, okay, xi or zeta, I don't know, zeta. Uh, uh, so there is another form, zeta, and its cube is this, right? Now, okay, now using this zeta, we introduce this expression, this expression, right? It turns out that this expression is a vector valued modular form. You see, we have differentials here. What is in general a vector valued modular form? Uh, in fact, uh, it's uh, relatively easy to explain to differential geometers. Uh, differential geometers know what symmetric tensors are. So imagine now that this te asymmetric tensor transforms in a modular way. You apply a transformation from some discrete group to your tensor and you get a factor, a, a, a factor, some factor. So it transforms as a tensor with a modular factor. And this is called vector valued modular forms. So it's not, this language is not used in the theory of vector valued modular forms. So when you look at formulas, they're quite horrible, but uh, they, uh, they are like tensorial formulas with an extra modular factor. So vector valued modular forms are symmetric tensors, which transform with a modular factor, right? Um, uh, okay, so uh, let's form this ratio you form this uh, vector valued modular form on the top, right? Vector valued modular form on of the top. It's a one form actually, differential one form. And you divide it by zeta square. It turns out uh, that uh, this is a well-defined holomorphic object. It's a vector valued, it's a modular covector, modular one form. Uh, what is, what was not known by the way in the literature, is that this covector is closed. So it's a differential of some function, all right? And this function G is precisely the function from the Lagrangian density that we saw before. That the function G from this, uh, okay, from, from this, this function G, right? This function G is precisely uh, uh, the antiderivative of this modular form. Uh, so it's quite remarkable that, okay, this, uh, this formula was studied by many uh, algebraic geometers, but nobody noticed that this is a total de de differential of some function. Uh, and by the way, although this is a modular form, 
the whole thing is a modular form, a vector valued modular form. This function g, the antiderivative, is not modular because there is some additive constant in its transformation law. It's killed by differentiation. But on its own, g is not a modular form. It's like an integral of a modular form. All right, so here are some references on, on modular forms of this, of this kind, on exactly these modular forms, right? And maybe, what is next? Next is a general case. But what I suggest, I will skip the general case because my time is up and uh, general case is similar, right? General case, this F is also a, a Picard modular form of three variables and there are similar formulas for this F. And I bet I don't load you more with more formulas. All right. So in this case, thank you very much. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, questions? Actually, maybe I have questions. So, so like you, you, you talk about real case, right? And you saw that said that there is open orbit, like in the beginning, Hirota case. Yeah. Uh, but, but but do you know if it's unique open orbit? You say it's generic, right? But it's it, it's unique open orbit because you can work over C as well. In no, fact. in C it will be it will be unique. That's clear. Over C it's unique. I can't say over R. I can't I can't say. Uh -huh. so this not, I can't say. It's not known. It, it's unique. It's not known. It's uh, it's not known. It, it's certainly unique over C. Right. Um. And when you are talking about this, the generations, uh, to which dimension can, can you go down? Uh, the lowest dimension, I think, is 12. And it corresponds to a linear Lagrangian. Say ux squared plus uy squared minus uz squared. Yeah, corresponding to the linear wave equation. That's and it, it has 12 dimensional group. From, from 20, you go to 12. And there are all intermediate cases. Ah, no, probably there is a gap from 12 to 14, I think. 13 doesn't happen, I think. So we are now working on this on the classification of these um, single orbits. There are at least 15 of them, at least 15. I think our list is complete now, but still there is, uh, we need to check something. Yeah? And it, it, it's clear that it's finite number of orbits. Oh, yes, yes. There are no parameters there. Just a finite number of orbits. Uh, and you do classification over C, right? Over C, yes. Over C, uh, yes, yes. We haven't finished, though. We haven't finished. But uh, it looks like uh, there are about 15 orbits. Uh, and we have explicit representatives for each of them. But does this finite number, does it follow from anything general or will you just like... Uh, no, it's just by inspection. I wouldn't, I don't know. Okay. Oh, well, maybe a related question. Um, yeah. Is there in a, well, is it possible to show that your solution space is actually algebraic and the sections are algebraic or... Yes, yes. Look, mm -hmm. uh, what you can do, uh, so this uh, involutive system, if you fix mm -hmm. a point, it's, uh, uh, it's just uh, jets, right, jets. Mm -hmm. And if you look at fourth order, fourth order jets are certain algebraic functions of low order jets. This is mm -hmm. your algebraic variety, yeah? Uh -huh. Fourth order jets, algebraic functions of third order and second order jets. These mm -hmm. are your algebraic equations. And then the group will be acting as algebraic group of this variety. So it's actually an algebraic variety sitting in Algebraic, like, in you jet, can think of it space. as an algebraic variety, yeah. If you look at jets. Mm -hmm. Well, this might explain why you have a finite number of orbits at least. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, all parameters. You see, when you classify, say, one dimensional sub subalgebras, there are parameters there, obviously. Yep. But when you uh, make an ansatz in the integrability conditions, mm -hmm. right, all these parameters disappear from requirement of involutivity from requirement of consistency. Mm -hmm. Only discrete number of parameters survive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't think for is that actually the fact that this algebra can explain finiteness, right? Because you don't talk about only high dimensional orbits, right? But about all orbits. There are definitely examples where they infinitely main. Well, you have an open orbit. Uh, mm -hmm. 
Yes, and, and, and lower down, you can have infinitely mean. Yeah, well. In principle. Yeah, in principle, maybe, yes. Usually, mm -hmm. algebra is, is, is a very strong hint that you'll have finite number of orbits. But, well, mm -hmm. you're right. It's not. Yeah, like, like so mm -hmm. actually it's action of Sol 2 in itself, right? In mm -hmm. orbits. It's algebraic action. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, may I pose a very elementary question? Sure, sure. So uh, you you often say uh, involutive systems, okay? So so uh, in what sense you say involutive system? Uh, in very simple, uh, uh, like imagine that uh, I have a very simple system. Say u x equals some one function. Say f of x y. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, u x equals mm -hmm. f and u y equals g. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, what is the consistency condition? U x y must equal u y x. So, so that so if all consistency conditions are satisfied. So, so that if we start some uh, system of PDE, okay. So right. that's case uh, in general we need the integrability conditions for to have solutions. Okay. So. Yeah. So, so that we generally so make prolongation to have uh, integrality conditions. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in your cases, so uh, in general, if we start with some system of differential equations by iterating the prolongations, we finally obtain some uh, involved systems. Okay. So, uh, uh, it's but uh, divided in uh, two. Uh, different cases that is finite type and or infinite type. Okay, so no, no, this is the, here it's finite type because finite type. But, okay, so okay, okay. So so your case is starting with some uh, uh, system of PDE and uh, with uh, integrability conditions. Okay, you have some finite uh, system of PDEs. Okay, is that okay? All? Okay, so so that my Question is uh, when uh, so one start with some special uh, system of PDEs, okay? So in that case, uh, to have some such very uh, how to say uh, interesting uh, related with many uh, uh, modular form, etc. So are there any so some uh, systematical approach to have? Some uh, special, interesting uh, type of differential equations. Uh, I would say uh, for every every modular form mm -hmm. satisfies a, a kind of an algebraic involutive mm -hmm. system right, of this uh -huh. kind. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Every modular form, uh -huh. and these are just two examples: theta constants yeah, yeah. and this Lagrangians. These are just two examples of the general phenomenon that for mm -hmm. every modular form. There is an underlying involutive algebraic differential system of finite time. Okay, but right? uh, well, conversely, starting with some uh, system of uh, uh, PDEs, okay. Mm -hmm. but, uh, so, uh, uh, are there any chance to have some uh, special interesting equations? Right, right. Solutions. You mean interesting solutions? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yes, yeah. Yes. Uh, 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 the first thing you need to check that your mm. system has nice symmetry, right? Because uh -huh. for modular forms, uh, uh -huh. you have either SL two symmetry, SL two R symmetry, or SL three R symmetry, or SP six uh -huh. symmetry. There must uh -huh. be a nice symmetry group acting uh -huh. uh, with an open orbit. So solution uh -huh. space of your system should be. Uh -huh. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, should have the same dimension as the group, right? Uh -huh. If you have uh -huh. these properties, then mm -hmm. there is a good chance you are dealing mm -hmm. with something very interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that is, uh, we bodies are uh, studying some approach to uh, differential equations, system of differential equations, uh, starting with some representation of uh, real algebra real groups, okay? Then we have uh, many, okay, many, many kind of uh, interesting differential equations. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. So uh, th this kind of approach uh, relates to uh, 
so what you talked uh, today is uh, uh, <coughs> uh, very interesting uh, solutions. Uh, so, but you say so, but not not always the symmetry, but moreover something additional structures for this equation you need. I I can't really say apart from the symmetry existing yes. symmetry I can't say any other what oh, is oh. it must be algebraic and the derivatives and have mm -hmm. a nice symmetry group. Oh, 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 that's oh. that's basically all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And also so when you are studying uh, system of PDs uh, you are always working on a regular point where you also consider a singular point of differential equations? Mm, singular points, probably not. Uh -huh. Probably if you're working uh -huh. with generic. Kind of. Okay, 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 okay. If there are no other questions, so let's thank Jenny again. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sandy. Thank you, thank you very much.